Frederick Shiny Ford, of sportscourier.com, joined by MMA's biggest Hulkamaniac, Bjorn Rebney. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Pretty good. And Bellator 68, excellent card. Kept off with Daniel Strauss realizing his dream, winning the featherweight tournament. Yep. Now on to another dream, going for that belt, facing the winner of Pitbull Curran. Yeah. Overall thoughts on the event? Uh, I thought it was a good event. I thought it was solid. You know, is it the best event we've ever done? No. And and uh, but I thought it brought some interesting action. I was, you know, I mean, Spirit Wolf Sarumskis. I mean, God, it just right as that started to turn into exactly what I thought it was and why we had it kick off the show. The commission stops it. You know, and it didn't. I mean, it didn't look like the cut was obscuring his vision. I mean, I never want to be one to second guess the commission, but man, that was at a stage where you really wanted to see the third. I mean, Spirit Wolf was doing exactly what he said he was going to do. He was standing with a guy whose stand-up game is, is everything that he lives and dies for. So, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I thought the Travis Marks and, Mal and uh, Marcus Cowboy fight was a great fight back and forth, probably the best fight of the night. Um, Marcin just keeps taking people's legs and submitting them. So, and then the last fight of the night was, you know, it, maybe not as action-packed as you'd think, but, you know, sometimes when you get two world-class guys, um, they kind of counter each other, and stylistically that didn't end up being the fight I thought it would be, but a big win for Daniel Strauss. A few months back in this very building, we had a fight that kind of started out with a groin shot, and I just had terrible flashbacks, I just nightmares. Did you have nightmares of Prindle Santos when that groin shot happened? Yeah, I think the words that crossed my mouth were, please, not again. And that shot was as solid as a shot that Santos, or that Santos kicked Prindle with, so... Um, it was nerve-wracking. Marlon Sandro's got an amazing heart. I mean, if you've ever seen him, he's fought a lot for Bellator, but his fights in Japan, some of them were just epic wars, where he was on the, the bad side of it and the good side of it. Um, so I knew he was going to come back. I knew he was going to keep fighting, but, um, yeah, it was scary. Scary right out of the box and a clean shot. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no questioning what happened there. It was a bad shot to the groin. So, um, fortunately, he, you know, was able to get up and keep fighting. But you hate to see a fight start out like that. Because, you know, you never know how much it takes out of somebody. So. Do you think poor Eric Prindle is going to get trolled on Twitter tonight? Uh, that I don't know. I just know Eric Prindle, God willing, is preparing like a wild dog for what he's got coming up in uh, two weeks from tonight in New Orleans because he's got a big challenge ahead of him in Cole Conrad. But um, I would assume that there's a lot of back and forth that probably involves Prindle right now. And Galvo with a great win, yeah. new decision. I feel like every time he gets the decision, same thing happens, like, with the whole main event, Prindle and Santos, the Halloween theme music plays in the back of his mind. Yeah. Uh-oh, who knows if he's going to win. That yeah. was a pretty close fight. Yeah. I actually had it for Marks, very, very slightly. Who did you have it for? I had it very, ever so slightly for Marcus. Um, I thought it was a super, super close fight. I was sitting next to Mo, and, and we were watching that fight intensely because it was really the best back and forth of the night. And I said, who do you think won? And he just threw his hands up in the air and said, I have no idea. It's a pick em fight. So... Um, you know, tough, but the, the good news is, is at least you and I are looking at each other saying, hey, it was a very close fight, and he gets the nod this time, which in the karmic reality that some of us may live in is a good thing because, boy, he got the short end of the stick in a couple of fights, the Nelvila fight and the Warren fight. He got, you know, two fights he probably objectively won. And, of course, he's originally from Brazil, now training in New York, doing his thing, Daniel Strauss, you see... These guys have a lot of support, you know, that yeah. kind of like a traveling circus just comes with them. Same thing with your lightweight champion, Michael Chandler. Yeah. How happy are you to see that kind of support, you know, for these young MMA up-and-comers, as well as, you know, for yourself, you know, with your family? I mean, obviously, you have the support of Viacom, TNA, Spike, and all that, but how much easier does it make it to have that family support system behind you? I mean, it's great. I mean, for, for those guys, it's spectacular. Every time you see those guys get into our cage, they've got this huge rooting section. they got people going nuts and, you know, and posters and billboards and stuff like that. And then for me, I got, you know, from a corporate perspective, the greatest family on the face of the earth. I've got a good family back at home in Chicago with my beautiful wife and a couple of kids and a dog and a cat. But um, from a corporate perspective, i got the best family on the fight between Viacom, Spike, Kevin K and the team there and the MTV Networks folks as a whole across just multiple areas of that business. Some um, doesn't get any better than that. And Held did his best Paul Harris impersonation. Yeah. Did pretty well. But Jimmy Smith and a lot of other people have been saying he should probably drop weight. And I've seen that too. I feel like he's been outsized in a lot of his fights. He's a very promising prospect at age 20. You definitely don't want to see him get burned out. Do you think it would be in his best interest to drop weight? Well, you and I have talked about it before. So many of the European fighters and a lot of the Japanese fighters just aren't used to cutting weight. And Marcin Held doesn't cut a lot of weight. He cuts about eight, nine pounds to make weight. And so 
you look at a guy like that in this weight division where there are monsters. I mean, you look at Chandler when he steps into the cage and he comes in emaciated on Thursdays, but by the time Fridays come around at about 3 o'clock, he's up at about 75, 78, fighting as a 55-pounder. So you look at Marcin and you think to yourself, boy, he really could drop. I mean, he could drop to 45, and, and those submission skills are just he's crazy on the ground. He's got some work to do in his stand-up game, but his game on the ground is just, it's, um, I mean, it's elite, elite, world-class, crazy submission game. And on a side note, I kind of lost count along with my cameraman over there on how many punches Michael Chandler threw at Gono. Did you get a count? I didn't. They were coming fast and furious, man. Michael Chandler has got huge finishing instincts, especially for a guy that's still relatively young in his career. We forget because he's done so much so quick, but his finishing instincts are just are just crazy. I mean, he's he's got finishing instincts. We've got a few guys that fight in around that weight class at 55 that have got wicked finishing instincts. Chandler's up top. Pitbull's got great finishing skills. And now look at Rick Hahn who's broken down from 70 and so often you see guys break down from one weight class to another and they don't bring their power with them because it's so tough to make weight but man Hahn has just brought incredible power with him and finishing in a way that we never saw him get close to at 170 pounds but he's just been a freight train at 55 so um, it's great to see I mean you love to see guys finish fights you don't leave any ambiguity and no judges get to make a decision so and we are going to transition now to impact wrestling but you have a guy in Impact Wrestling that's actually going to also fight for Bellator Fighting Championships. Of course, cast out of the bag, it is King Mo Lawal. Lots been said already about his acquisition, but overall thoughts and brevity. Uh, just hugely excited. You know, I've spent a lot of time around Mo over the last month as we've been putting this, you know, really integrated deal together between Spike and Dixie and myself, and Dick, Dixie at Impact, obviously, and Spike with Kevin. And um, I've just been working like crazy, but he's just, he's all in, and he's just a big personality and super smart and just gets it and understands how he'll be able to bounce between the two and is you know he's a hardcore wrestling fan I mean he's a guy that can quote stuff from WCW he's a guy that can quote stuff from the early days of the WWF before it was a WWE um, knows the game loves the game wants to jump into that the way he jumped into MMA out of being one of the best wrestlers literally that the US has produced in the last decade so um, he's just all in and a great character and it's gonna be a ton of fun watching him uh, enter the Bellator cage when we get to Spike in January, but also watching him enter the Impact ring in this fall on Spike. So it's just uh, it's pretty exciting stuff. Now, I am straight edge, but long necks and red necks are my friends, as is James Storm. And he lost last month at lockdown. You didn't make a prediction. I want to see if you'll make a prediction here. Rob Van Dam, Bobby Roode, you didn't see Impact Wrestling. It's now a ladder match. Right. I would go against Root only because of the interplay that took place between Mo. I've got to have Mo's back. But uh, from a prediction standpoint, I will stay out of it. I will just tell you that anybody who's an enemy of King Mo is an enemy of Bjorn. Speaking of enemies, Abyss is back. Yeah. <laughs> what? Where has he been? That's a very good question. If I knew, I couldn't tell you, but I don't know. Well, we can chat here on this. Of course, as always. Plug your Twitter, because you've been tweeting me back a few times lately, and I really appreciate that, but you've been kind of slacking. Uh, you know what? I haven't been slacking. It's just the lack of sleep, and I've been trying to hit the Twitter at about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning when I'm getting ready to go to bed, but then I'm not making a lot of sense because it's foggy. So I will. It's at Bjorn Rebney, and I always get back to you because you have intelligent, funny stuff to say, so I'm always hitting you back, but I, I do what I can do. And do you think if we tweet Alexander Shemenko a bunch of happy faces that one day he'll come back with a smile? I would absolutely doubt that. I would not bet the farm, the house, the car, or even a couple of dollars in spare change on that. I don't think that smiling is part of his repertoire. Well, we hope he's smiling when he sees this. Bjorn, thank you so much. Thanks.